I very much appreciate you coming today. And hopefully you'll learn a little something and be able to bring something back to your jobs. Uh, so I'm Susan Prue, and today we're going to be discussing when worlds collide, uh, the relationships between planners and sponsors, uh, making sure that they're both mutually beneficial and long-lasting, because that's really our goal here, right? A couple housekeeping notes quick. Uh, the evaluation for today's session is found on your mobile app. So it's the special events show, the special events show .com forward slash TSE mobile. So just a reminder for that today. I actually want to kick off with a video. Some of you might recognize this video because this was huge over the last year, but it's my favorite sponsorship to date. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do.
So who am I? I know I said I'm Susie Pru. Uh, I work as a senior sales account executive at BDA Productions. And for those of you who don't know BDA, we are a 3D experiential marketing agency and a full service event production company. So we really create the 3D visualization of a brand. And then of course, support it with all of the lighting, the theme decor, the branded staging, the audio visual pieces in an effort to do that. I'm also a newly married lady, uh, about a year and a half. I'm Italian, so I do this with my hands a lot. So <laughs> you kind of see me or I end up throwing this at you. It's not in malice. It's just kind of me being animated. Uh, I am from New England. So anybody here from New England, I'd love a shout out again. And then I'm going to talk a little of what really my background is for today's discussion is my involvement with associations. ISIS, MPI, anybody involved with ISIS at all, a member? Yeah, love that. Anybody MPI member, PCMA, involved in open association. So I started at ISIS as the director of membership a few years back, but now I work with MPI as the director of operations. And, the, and the last year, I was the director of sponsorship. So I dealt with the cash financial sponsorships for the chapter, as well as the in-kind contributions, which are venues, vendors, people looking to showcase their product and services. So that's really what we're going to pretty much talk about today. The battle between planner and sponsor. It doesn't have to be this epic. <laughs> how many of you, I, I can't tell you how often I have planners come to me saying, you know, I really love producing this event, but my sponsor's feeling that they want everything from me. They keep asking me for this, they keep asking me for that, and I can't promise that. And the sponsors will come to me and say, you know, I just don't feel valued. I feel like I'm working in this organization and I'm not getting anything out of it. I don't feel like the planners really want me there or really want me to succeed. And I'm here to tell you that that no longer needs to happen. It needs to be a mutual conversation that the two of you have together. And hopefully, I'll give you some points to take home today. So what are we going to discuss? Top bullet points for today. The vision and mission of the meeting. What's your goal? Before you even think about approaching a sponsor, you need to put together the goals of your event. How are you going to measure the success of that? Keeping the balance, that's a big one today. So we're going to talk about setting expectations and realistic expectations, how we're going to approach the sponsors, and we'll talk about some partnership that, partnerships that worked and why they worked. Creating a living and green sponsorship document. Anybody here have a sponsorship guide that they work with? Yeah, I love it. Raise your hand high. I want to see that. Do you, do you find it successful for you? That's a nice kind of time. We do um, one whole like year year long sponsorship packet that we send out to people, and they can pick and choose. But I feel like people get lost in that. So we also follow up with individual, like, just specific events, specific. brochures as well. Perfect. And then I we love do that. an agreement, you know, if we do get a sponsor. I love that because you've actually tied in a piece that a lot of people don't do. They focus just on specific events. But when you're targeting annual sponsors, it's important to kind of lay out the entire groundwork for the year. So what else are you doing? What else can they be involved in? So I love that. So we're going to talk today about building that shell and what it should include and why. And then, of course, we're going to get to some fun stuff. Social media, yay, I love it. Tweets, hashtags, good stuff, woo, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I will bring up somebody to talk a little bit more about that, too, later on. So moving forward, that's the truth. I don't want to hear myself speak. This is an interactive group. It's the last session of TSE. Let's make it count. I want to hear your best practices or things that aren't working. And let's see if we can kind of learn from each other. Because it shouldn't just be me talking to you. You all have good things that have happened and maybe not so good things that have happened, and we're going to try to fix that going forward. I don't know that lady on the left, but I love that picture. And that is me on the right just kind of being grumpy. So I thought that it was fun to kind of include a little, a little picture of me growing up. <laughs> so let's talk about those goals. There can be multiple. How are you measuring the success of your event. Is it attendees? Are you a small event or group and you're looking to grow each year? 
How many dollars raised? Are you, any of you incorporate a fundraising element into your events? Love it. Love it. Live auctions, silent auctions, those types of things. Anything really fun that worked? Go ahead. I did a wine pool this year. I work for a nonprofit, um, so we had a wine pool and we sold 200 bottles at $25 a ticket. I love that. Yeah. Booze is great. Booze is great. People <laughs> love it. Awesome. And, and you got something that was a takeaway, regardless of, um, I mean, the quality of the wine was different, but yep. you know, some got a $100 value, some got a $9 value. Wonderful, and it worked. And it worked. And your attendees felt like they were they loved it. They were feeling it. Yeah. Now, did you have a wine sponsor? Yes. So not only did the attendees benefit from it, but your sponsor did too. Yeah. Because we put like little um, cakes on each of the bottles that has a logo, and then we took big signage over the display. Awesome. That's yeah. great. Really fun. That actually is a great segue to my next point. Whatever works for your event in generating money, can you find a way to tie your sponsor into that? It's something to think about. Let's say your, your demographic is 25-year-olds. A good key piece of that might be the bar tying into your wine list. <laughs> Can we find a way to maybe bring in those liquor sponsors because the, their target demographic that might buy their booze is there. And your revenue is coming from the bar anyway. So can we get them involved? Go ahead. And we also had a corporate sponsor, which a lot of people didn't think of. Yeah. But this um, organization wanted the recognition. I think that's a fantastic idea. I'd love to get your information after. Okay. I might use you as a case study going forward. Okay. <laughs> Is it to include some element of interactivity? You know, we're always trying to find ways to bring together attendees and engage them. Is that a piece? Is that a goal that you'd like to see in your future events? Corporate social responsibility. Has anybody not heard of co corporate social responsibility or CSR? All right, so that's, that's the process that a company can take uh, to generate a positive impact on its community, on the environment, on the world, uh, through its actions. And so usually what they like to do is involve themselves on something of goodwill. And it's a great piece to make your attendees feel like they're giving back to something, and your sponsors as well. Talking about a charity involvement. Do any of your fundraising or benefits of your events benefit children? In that case, tie in the children. Bring the children to the event. When you're thinking about what you're doing, incorporate teddy bears, teddy bear sponsors. Even better, find somebody who's interested in donating the teddy bear shell and have your attendees build teddy bears. Get them involved. Let them know who they're impacting. It creates a much better emotional tie to the success of your event. Think about food differently. Ice cream, toys, any of that. I understand sometimes it's for an adult atmosphere, but think about how you want to position your event, especially if it's benefiting a charity. Going back to the emotional connection, share stories. You need to find a way to not only get your attendees, but your sponsors to want to be part of it. It's not about what they're donating or what they're giving you or the dollar amount necessarily. It's about how can they connect with your attendees and the event as a whole. So for this example, if you are benefiting veterans or are men and women overseas, bring them or any of them that are home, bring their families. Who are you impacting? To tie in the interactive element, maybe there's a, an iPod station that showcases videos of our men and women talking about how you're impacting Care packages. This is great for sponsors because almost anything can go into them. Even have your attendees build them on site. Let them know that they're contributing to somebody specific. And the sponsorships can be endless with that. Socks and beef jerky were the most requested pieces for our veterans overseas. I did one of these once and that's what they really wanted more than anything. <laughs> so just fun little tidbit for that. Going back to interactivity, are you showcasing a product at your events? Are you launching a new product or service? Find a way to get your attendees engaged in that. So don't just talk about it, like, I have this new product here. I love Samsung Galaxy because if anybody's seen them in the stores and in the malls now, 
It's not about just buy our phone. Even Apple started this. It's come in, experience what you're going to play with. Open up the iPad. Open up the iPhone. Touch it. How do you like the way the music sounds? Do you like the way the keys feel? Everybody's feeling it and experiencing it. So that might be one of your goals. Build upon existing framework. You know, we talked about growing your event. If you have a small event, you want to make it bigger. What about introducing media? Are we trying to get more advertising? It's not just always about the attendee size, but we want to grow it in a bunch of different ways. So think about that. Don't be afraid. Going back to this real quick. If something doesn't work, don't continue doing it. I can't tell you how many times people always say, well, we've, we've just always done it that way. Uh, well, that's just always how we've had the bar, and that's always how we've done our seating. No, get that out of your brains. Be innovative. Be different. Think. Challenge yourself. and Challenge your event. Your attendees will appreciate it, and your sponsors will want to get involved because you're doing that. So the social media footprint. Felix Baumgartner. He got a lot of likes after that big jump of 128,000 feet. But maybe you're looking to introduce this element to your events. Hashtags, tweets, Facebook, any of the above. You can have all of those goals. You can have one of those goals. But if you think about all of them and try to take a little piece of each, I guarantee you, you'll be building a much more successful event without even knowing it. So now that you have the groundwork for putting together your event, it's time to think about the sponsors and balancing the two. So where do we start? Here. First things first, before you even think of sponsors, after you've created your goals, start the event budget. Think about catering, think about lighting, think about decor. Where are all your funds going to? And where are all your expenses going to? Is there something I'm missing? Labor, staffing? Anything else that's a huge piece that I seem to have forgotten? This will help you open up the doors to possibilities. And it will help you to figure out who you should be targeting. Take what you've done in years past and start thinking about what you might want to change. The layout, the floor plan, the dynamic of the event in and of itself. If you're thinking of changing something, for example, if we want to target more children and families coming to an event, we might move it from an 8 p.m. dinner to a 1 p.m. afternoon event. So if you're going to do something like that, think about why you want to do it and be able to sell that to the sponsor, or at least be able to talk to the sponsor of why you wanted to make that change. Know who's coming to your event. I can't even tell you <laughs> how important knowing and understanding demographics are. You should know the average amount of people that come, plus how old they are, maybe even what income bracket they fall in, male, female, any of that. So that's a key piece. Gather that information before you start to approach people. In addition to that, Walk the event as an attendee. I call it an attendee walkthrough. Sometimes us, we, we as planners, we go through it thinking on our level. Like, yep, registration's going to be here. Yep, everybody's going to come walk through here. And then we're going to have dinner and it's going to be seated. And sometimes you need to take that step back and walk through it as an attendee. So I encourage you to start to think about that as you're moving forward, too. Once you know your demographic and your target audiences, you can start to find sponsors that are targeting the same audience. That's a huge key. If your event, for example, is essentially male, 60 years old, average income, you can find sponsorships in golf resorts, maybe Rogaine, I don't know, something fun. Uh, <laughs> Something along those lines, but you don't necessarily want to target the toy makers for that specific event. So once you understand and grasp who your target audience is, that's going to be a huge jumping off point for when you're starting to go out there and market yourselves to sponsors. Cash versus in-kind. Does anybody have more of one than the other? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah? <laughs> you in the back. You have more people willing to volunteer and less cash? Is that it? I have more income. Perfect. Yeah, that, especially with this economy. Let's talk about our next topic. The sponsorship document. I am so glad, I'm sorry, to hear that people actually have them because I can't tell you how sometimes I talk about this sponsorship document and people say, I don't, I don't even know how to write it. And I don't know how to build one of them. It's scary and I don't really want to do it. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's necessary and it's key because it will help to convey the importance of your event to your sponsors. So where do we start? I am highlighting the MPI New England sponsorship template because I helped create it. So <laughs> I thought it would be fun to highlight that. And we'll kind of walk through some things that I think works with it. And maybe you guys have some changes that you think it should maybe be different. And if you have a personal piece, you know, your document at home has a little bit of this, please share that. I'd love to know how we can always make this better. So the cover page. Number one thing you should always include throughout this entire document is pictures. Find a way to showcase to your sponsors people having fun at your event. People participating. Make sure, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah? I, I usually try to include on my cover a testimonial from the attendee the year before as well, and especially a spot that's fun to Absolutely. as best as possible. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a key thing, and I was going to get into that. Right. No, no, no. I Please, do not apologize. If you have something to share, please jump out and say it. Uh, if you have a theme, you know, in this instance, we used raising the bar. We wanted to set a higher standard for the next year with our sponsors. If there's something specific, if you're doing multiple events throughout the year or one event, is there something common that you want to put on there? Put your company name, all of those things should go on the cover page. Cover page. I think table of contents is a key piece. It sounds silly, and I can't, you're going to say, oh my God, so you're going to walk through the whole thing. I'm not going to walk through the whole thing, I assure you. But table of contents is key because if you have a sponsor that's interested in donating money or part of their product, they want to know exactly where they can jump to. I want to go to page 10. I got to jump to page 8 because I'm not interested in all this other fluff. Make sure you include that. If you can, have a page dedicated to your event overview. What is your event? What are you doing? Who are you targeting? What is it going to be? What is the essence of that? And use all of the goals that you put together and formulate that mission. And make sure that's a presence or a state or at least a page of this. Numbers are key. Remember those statistics I told you to come up with? Use them. Put them as part of this. People love little bullet points. 55% of our attendees are over the age of 60. Well, that's, that's good to know, especially if you're targeting those golf sponsorships or those resorts. Make them understand who's there, who's coming, and what the potential is. Cash is king. I think my experience and what I suggest is creating tiered values for your cash sponsors. Platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. There's not a lot of ambiguity, well, there's a little bit of ambiguity in that, but it kind of leaves it in a general idea. And it says, this person gave this amount of money, and they were entitled to this. I'd save your best offerings for your cash sponsors, because I think that's huge. But creating those clearly defined bullet points and sections is huge for them to say, you know what, I like what that $2,500 option is. Or if I pay the 10 k what am I getting more? I would reserve your platinum sponsors as one to two companies or individuals. The whole essence of a platinum sponsorship is to be the top of the top. If you're normally in, if you normally gain, let's say, the biggest donation you've ever got from a sponsor is about 5k. Set your platform sponsor a step higher than that. Something that you have not retained. That should be the section that you are, is your reach, your goal. Your goal section should be targeted to companies that you feel you can get a few of them on. Five, eight, ten of them. And then silver and bronze, you should be able to populate accordingly. So I took a, a snapshot of what's offered in a platinum package. This is something specifically that MPI New England does.
But here are some ideas that you can include as part of your benefits. Website advertising. Mentions in newsletters, e-communications, directories, anything like that. Branding at the event. And let them know that's customizable. If they say, you know, I really don't like your signage opportunity, I really want something else. Okay, not a problem. We can find a way to make that work. Is it mailings to attendees? Do they want to be able to mail something to your attendees? Advertisements, email addresses. Do they want to speak at the event? Do they want a couple minutes to say, here's what I do? Some people are like, oh my god, I don't want my sponsor to speak at all. Oh my god, that would be so bad. But some people say, you know, it's not the biggest thing. They're giving us money. They are entitled to something like that. It's up to you. Each event is different. Is it free tickets to the event? You know, make sure that you find a way to recognize them. Can you utilize a percentage of their dollars for something specific, like a volunteer reception, hospitality area, registration? The sponsors that are giving you cash are going to, most times, want to know where that cash is going. So be ready to have some conversations of where you think you can throw some dollars to. When you think about in-kind sponsorships, you can use the same offerings you give to cash, but I will say it, and I know I get a lot of negative feedback with this, in-kind sponsorships is not the same as a cash sponsorship. It's just not. I don't care if your product is valued at $25,000 worth of stuff, and it's a great, great product. It's not the same as giving me a check for twenty five k. It's just not. And your sponsors, while I wouldn't go touting that to them, there needs to be a difference between the two, and it's okay that there is one. Even if there's a media sponsorship, can you go into a little more detail? Um, I, I was going, say I was going to buy ten thousand dollars worth of ads in the Chicago Tribune anyway, mm -hmm. and they, I talked with them and they gave me an in-kind media sponsorship. So in that case, isn't it? In that thing? case, it would be. But I'm talking about if you're saying I'm giving you twenty-five thousand dollars worth of food for this event, while needed and hugely wonderful, and I can give you a great list of benefits, sometimes it's worth separating the two, because if they say, well, I didn't get the same thing that that platinum sponsorship, and my thing was worth $25,000, and that platinum sponsor that paid $25,000 gets X, 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 and X, it's a reality, and it's, to me, it's important to say that. You didn't write a checkout, they did. It's not to say, if they're not getting the value, then that needs to be a continuous conversation that you have with them and say, if you're not feeling the value for this donation, we need to work on that and make sure you feel that. But it's not the same as cash. And I think that's a huge Why? Thing. I, I mean, think if it's a product that you would have paid cash for, but if it's something that you need for the event and you would pay for it, why would that not be valued the same? Most of the events don't go into raising cash for it to just literally fund their event. It's going into something else in their organization. If they're benefiting a charity, if they're benefiting themselves, whatever it might be, the cash absolutely has a higher value. The event in, a, in, a, in an in-kind situation has a value, but, and I know I get a lot of negative pushback on it, but it's just, it's not the same. They're helping you in one specific instance doing what they do, and it's their product that they're, that they're showcasing. It's not specifically the same as writing a check. Think about it. Most people would rather get cash of 25K <laughs> than an in-kind contribution. Sometimes you can blur the lines a little bit. Sometimes it's okay to say it's not. I can blend it a little bit. In the back, was first. Well, I mean, a cash sponsorship is, I mean, that's the, that's the back. If someone is giving you a $25,000, you know, food, that didn't cost that vendor $25,000. Exactly. So it really is a higher value and should be recognized. Exactly. Uh, did you have another question for Steve? Yeah. Well, I was just going to support your, your uh, thoughts here and that I came from the media in the past, worked in that, and you know, you run uh, specials and packages each month, but when you're when you're working with trade, you know, they're getting the, you know, rack rate, if you will, for exactly. that package, which is normally about 40% higher than you would have been able to purchase it for. Of the market, because it's not costing them $25,000 right. to produce that. It's costing them whatever percentage of the market. Very so good. Even understanding you're doing any kind of donation versus cash, is if, if you're looking for sponsors to raise money for a charity, say for you know, children's services, 
I can't take $25,000 worth of catered food and help children's services. I can take $25,000 and help children's services. I, I can agree with that. I understand. But for example, if um, you, know, you need to raise money to pay for overhead for that organization, you've got rent, utilities, and everything else, payroll. Um, and let's say you go after a, a utility company as a sponsor. How is that any different? Yeah, the utility I, company right. is it's a good point, and some people, and it's, it's true, because some people say, I feel the need to give, if it's a $25,000 catering sponsorship, I need to give the same to my $25,000 cash fund. I don't recommend that. I think that there's there's an importance that, for the most part, people accept and believe, but I, I have been wrong in those situations before. Do you have a comment? I, uh, I work on the corporate side, but I also run the board of a lot of nonprofits, and a lot of what we do as a company sometimes combination of both and I think that's where it lies within your relationship with your sponsor to say what can you realistically do and as far as while there is merit to any kind I think sometimes another good thing to have a conversation about is well what would be the cost of your labor because sometimes that's really all you care about if the owner is going to give the actual assets but they're worried about the people or the staff that are working Great point. that's a different conversation absolutely great point and again all of these are just conversations you need to be able to talk to each of them differently. And if they negotiate a little bit better, if some companies say, I want a little bit more than this, and their value of what they're giving is more valuable to you, you have to find, that's business. And this is a business. You're generating revenue, sponsors, whatever it might be. So find a way to make money at it. So, I mean, it's just certain things to think about. But again, this should all be conversations with your individual sponsors. A la carte benefits. This is a huge piece to include in your sponsorship document. If you can let the, this goes back to kind of people that are, this goes back to your point, ma'am, when you're talking about like, well, I want to make sure that my in-kind people feel like they're getting just as much love. If you put out in-kind bullet points and say, you know what, this isn't costing me money and let them build their own proposal, they feel like they have the power. They feel like they're getting the, the benefits that they want. I don't really care about attendance at the event. I don't want to go, but I do really want that website advertising that you're going to give me. So can I get that for longer? Instead of nine months, can you offer it for a year, maybe two years? So think about that. Let them choose it. And piggybacking on that, let them know what's customizable. You know, I know that you have signage over the bar that you like to do, and that's awesome. But I was thinking I could bring in this interactive thing that when I come in, people order their drinks, and I do this little thing on the iPad, and then they can enter in their email address and give it to them. Fine. If it's something you feel comfortable with. But if they have some ideas that they'd like to bring as part of the event, I absolutely encourage those conversations. Let them do the work for you if there's something specific that obviously doesn't, you know, Hurt your event mission. Go ahead. Can, in this case, you specify the amount of sponsorship that you need, and they will build their own sponsorship package. Or they do. So, in, in this case, in the in kind, we'll usually say, We're looking for a production sponsor. We're looking for an annual sponsor. We're looking for, well, annual sponsor would probably fall more in the cash category, but production, audio visual. We're looking for uh, a linen sponsor, a signage sponsor, something that is specifically tangible to what somebody can provide. And it doesn't get blurred in with platinum or bronze or silver, silver because those have specific dollar amounts attached to them. Because this person can valid, value their signage sponsorship as 50 grand, and this person can value their signage opportunity as 10K. Well, which is it? And how do you decide? Do you devalue one because this person happened to have a better price? No. So that's why you create a new name for it. So that's why it's not, it can't even be associated completely separates them. Your offerings can be the same, but the way you expose and showcase them is different. Calendars. I brought this up before because that, that lady in the back there had mentioned that we do a bunch of events. Let your sponsors know, because they might not want to just be involved in one event. They might want to be involved in a walkathon that you're doing. There might be several events that you do. Uh, so if you have a calendar that showcases some of the upcoming things you're doing throughout the year, include that. That's huge. Testimonials, thanks to my favorite lady in the front here for bringing up a very great point. If there are sponsors that have worked with you in the past that have gotten business or have found a way to say this is a great, great sponsorship and a great way to get your name out there, include that. 
and never hesitate to include a list of sponsors that are involved in your event. Let them know, I have 10, I have 20, I have 50 people who want to help me. Don't you want your name on that list? And it's, it's okay if you're targeting two competing sponsors. It gets a little hairy sometimes, and usually I wouldn't do that in the in-kind category, but sometimes it forces the dollars. Coke and Pepsi, for example. If Coke is a, is a platinum sponsor, you can try to target Pepsi. They might want to outbid Coke. This is very few and far between. <laughs> but you can at least let them know, these people, Coke is targeting your market share. Don't you want to get involved in that? Again, it's business. Don't take it personal. <laughs> and again, on, that, on your final page of the document, include who you are. I can't even tell you how many I've run through that people don't actually have contact information of who to reach out to should they be interested. Pictures, contact information, all of that. It's a great way to end it. <laughs> I loved her. <laughs> that was a little tacky, maybe a little risque for a session, but I thought advertising is not to be confused with sponsorship. So we've talked a little bit about <laughs> advertising and how we tie that into a lot of our sponsorships. If your sponsorship department is different than your advertising department, you two should be married. So we'd like to have you buy an ad with us this year again, and they say, you know what, I'm really interested in doing more this year than the ad. How about if I give a little bit more money, could I get my name on the bar? Could I do something specific for the opening reception, whatever it might be? You need to make sure that those advertising people know who to contact in your sponsorship department. And likewise, if you're a sponsor, or if you're working with a sponsorship, and they no longer want to be involved on a high level, but they want to find a way to still be involved, you still want their money, you still want to make sure that you get some kind of contribution from them. So if they're interested in just doing an ad, you can say, absolutely, I can point you right in the direction of our advertising salesperson, or whoever that might be. So make sure that you're on the same page with that, so you're not both making calls to the same company, because that's embarrassing. You don't want to be over, and you don't want to duplicate your efforts. So both of you should be able to talk to both. Be creative. I know everybody's trying to find the new, most innovative way to showcase their sponsors, and not everybody has that element of creativity. Um, but it wouldn't be TSE if I didn't find it. Talk about a great vendor that I had the chance to connect with. Uh, I found Monster Media, and what they do is specifically work with sponsors. They're a full service media company, and they specialize in digital advertising. So they develop these innovative ways for people to showcase, showcase their sponsors, which I thought was so cool. So if you have some dollars that you can throw to that, or some cash sponsors, I want to talk you through a couple, a couple videos that they have. This next video that you'll see, I haven't started it yet. Monster Media was working with Travelers Insurance, you know, the red umbrella. And Travelers wanted to get in front of the attendees attending the Nutcracker Ballet in New York City. They said, that's a market that I feel like I want to get in front of. Knowing that the demographic attending the ballet were children, and a lot of their parents, they created the Land of Sweets, which was an interactive wall display that uh, people could come up and touch all of the red umbrellas, all of the red travels umbrellas, and they turned into nutcracker characters, sweets, whatever it might be. But it was a brand message. It was something to tie in their brand in a different level. So here you can see how it was executed.
always the budget is there, but sometimes to think a little, it, this incorporates interactivity, it engages attendees, and it has that recognizable brand image of the red umbrella, which is travelers, and that's what they want people to take home and remember. The next video was for Sea Island. Along similar lines, they wanted to create an exhibit, an interactive exhibit, uh, inside Grand Central Terminal in New York City uh, for the attendees that were there for the squash championship, the J.P. Morgan Tournament of Champions. And they created this display, an interactive display, of people experiencing life at Sea Island, which is a high-end resort in southeast of Georgia, if anybody doesn't know. Again, to try to find ways to bring people to get excited about this resort area. The income level of people that attend squash is high, apparently. Their demographic is an upper income bracket. So they thought this was the perfect area to introduce themselves to a new group of potential customers. Monster Media helped to design a problem-solving problem -solving challenge at this specific conference. This is just for fun. Hollander, the wealthy bag lady, and founder of Sponsor Concierge, 
Do you want to get corporate sponsors so you can do what you love and have a company foot the bill for it? Well, to get corporate sponsors, you need an industry standard sponsor proposal. So I want to let you know what goes in that sponsor proposal. You need a compelling story. And I teach people to do sponsor proposals in a way nobody else does because we start with your story. We make an emotional connection with that company and you're going to be so much more successful this way. You need a description of your property. You need to tell the prospective sponsor what you do. Are you a speaker, an author? Do you have a book tour? Do you do events? Do you have a charity? You need to let them know exactly what you do. We need to put activation in there. This is how a sponsor will activate or put into play your sponsor program and pay you the big bucks. Your mission statement. What do you want to do? How do you want to make a difference in this world? Sponsors care about that and we put that in the sponsor proposal. Your demographics. This is one of the most important things in the sponsor proposal. Who do you know? Who can you reach for the sponsors? You're going to help the sponsor reach their core consumers. Testimonials. Other people saying how great you are, how great your business, your organization, your brand, your charity is. The rights fees. This is where you ask for the money. And deliverables. What assets do you have? What benefits do you have for that particular sponsor? Media. Did you know one of the best kept secrets is that you can get media without even paying for it on trade? So you can get media sponsors as well as corporate cash sponsors. And lastly, compelling benefits. You know, most people don't know the right benefits to put in their sponsor proposal. And this is so critical because sponsors are not going to write that check and fund you if they don't see the benefits for them. So knowing how to write a great sponsor proposal will make you so much more successful in getting corporate sponsors. Whether you work with me or not, I wanted you to have this information. And I want to let you know that at Sponsor Concierge, we do it for you and we do it the right way. So this is Linda Hollander, the Wealthy Bag Lady. I want you to live your passion of life and do it bravely and go for your greatness and I want to make it happen for you. Okay, well with the exception of the Wealthy Bag Lady title, <laughs> she really has a great message. And she really finds a way to say, I can help you. If you don't want to do this, you can hire me and I can come and do this for you. So sometimes people just need that. They say, I can't do this on my own. I feel to bring somebody in. So if anybody wants any information on Linda or, or Todd over at Monster Media, I'm happy to provide that at the end. They're both really creative people. I want to segue now to just quickly social media. Uh, a couple fun things. I'm going to bring up my boss because she's my boss. She made me. Just kidding. Uh, who really has an expertise in social media and, and marketing to people and incorporating that into your events. here and I just want to touch base a little bit about social media and I know you've probably all been inundated with social media, social media all week. It's a big topic. There's a lot to cover and I'm not going to uh, cover everything. I just want to touch on a few points that mean something now, which are poignant now. Um, who am I? <laughs> I am the Director of Sales and Marketing at BDA Productions in Boston. Uh, that is me enjoying a cocktail, which I'm sure you would all like to do very soon after this. I'm going to have them close the doors, though, now, because you've all seen me without makeup, and you all must die. So, there is no escape. He's... Thank you. Um, so, because we all work so hard, don't we? I mean, really, let's... I raise a glass to everybody in this room. Um, I have some really great news. We are up for an award this evening uh, for event technology, and I bring it up to you only because it's something that is pertinent to all the events and everything that we do on a daily basis. I can see everybody out here right now, you've all got your iPads, you've got your iPhones, your droids, everything else. You're tweeting, 
you're staying connected during the sessions. I'm sure you've stayed connected on the show floor and upstairs. Where did you charge your stuff? Right? Can you see any plugs in this room? There's one right over there. There's one right here. I saw a lady last night at the Search Foundation. Did everybody go to the Search Foundation event last night? She came over, she plugged it in wherever she could, she threw her phone on the floor, and she's like, hey, how are you? How's it going? <laughs> it was a great way to meet people, don't get me wrong. It was like, hey, great, how are you? <laughs> um, but she threw it on the floor, and she had to stand there and wait. She was captive. I, I mean, she wasn't going anywhere, and she kind of knew that, so she was like, so. <laughs> we had to think, you know, think of something to talk about. Um, this is... And it's not going to be a secret after tonight. This is sort of the bonus of coming to the last session, one of the last sessions on the last day. Uh, we are introducing a charging valet. And the reason I bring this up, I know, we're very excited about it. Uh, you know how you got your badge scanned on the way in? We're going to zap it. You're going to give me, you're going to entrust these people with your um, smartphone, your smart technology. You are going to get a ticket like you would waiting for your table, and I bring everything back to food, by the way, so <laughs> food, food, food. You're going to put your smartphone or your device, and they're gonna take it, they're gonna put it in the cubby with the appropriate connection. You're going to go and continue to enjoy the show floor, a session, uh, your networking event, lunch, whatever you wanna do, and you're gonna come back when your phone is charged, you're gonna give us your ticket, we're gonna Make sure it's you. We're going to give you your smartphone, your technology, whatever, and you're going to go on your way. There's no downtime anymore. You're not standing by the one outlet waiting for the outlet. I've done that at the airport. It's awful. Uh, you're not going to stand with everybody else at like a juice bar, you know, and kind of mingle with people that you may or may not want to talk to. Um, you're free. You're absolutely free. And why do I bring this up? This is a sponsorship opportunity. Do you see all that white space? Mm -hmm. Brand it. Sell it. Say to your sponsor, to whomever, and the great part about this is that everybody wants to be on the cusp of this. You could have your wine person, you could have uh, another technology, you could have a um, corporate sponsor, a mom and pop shop, whomever, depending on what event you're at and what your gift practices, what your goals are, who your attendees are, Craig says Hooters could sponsor this if they wanted to. Um, but it could, it's for anybody because everybody wants to be associated with the technology with keeping people engaged and connected and free to do what they want to do. And believe me, you're going to remember it. So that's why I bring it up. It's something, too, that you have to keep in mind. What's universal? What's something that everybody is seeking? And anybody recognize this? And not specifically event, but do you recognize it?